Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever in the ages of all ages. Amen. Today is the Feast of Transfiguration. It's, as we read in the Synexarium moments ago, this is one of the minor feasts of the Lord in the Church. And it has a lot of significant meanings for us, and we think, what happened exactly? Well, the Lord took Peter, James, and John up to the mountain, and at the top of the mountain, he basically was transfigured. He shone brighter than the sun, brighter than whiter than the snow, to, as a witness to the glory of God, of how Jesus is in eternity, how he looks in eternity. Because we understand that when he came to earth, he emptied himself completely to be man, that he may take our sins upon him, that he may live our life completely. There is not one moment in the Lord's divinity and unity of the divinity and his humanity at any moment where he uses divinity or his authority to kind of help him. Quite the contrary, he only used the divine authority for particular miracles to help people. But for himself, for his own comfort, when he was hungry, he didn't change the stones to bread when he could have. He, there are many things Jesus could have done to give himself comfort, and he didn't. Because his authority, he never misused it. It was never for him. It was to bring humanity back to the image in which humanity was created. So, the disciples were taken up to the mountain today. Three of them, Peter, James, and John. And... It's a reminder of, for us that following Jesus is wherever He decides to take us. He may want us to go up to a mountain with Him. He might want us to go to a plain with Him. Regardless of where He wants us to go, we are called to follow Him. And following Jesus is not just an image. It's not just a, a pattern of uh, ideas or religious laws. It's much, much more than that. Even... David the prophet in the shepherd psalm in Psalm 23 he says, What the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He even says later, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, I will fear no evil, you are, because you are with me. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So wherever you lead me, Lord, I will follow. This is another important mark of a true Christian. Because there are those who live their Christianity according to a certain comfort level. Past this, if it starts to get a little bit uncomfortable, no, I can't, sorry. You're on your own. I will follow you in the glory, but I won't follow you to the cross, for example. The devil says, I'll give you glory without suffering. But at the end, there's no glory at all. Jesus says, follow me, take up your cross, deny yourself, follow me daily, which means suffer with me, and then I'll give you glory but the real glory that they won't fade away. So following Jesus is an important point that we need to ask ourselves at every moment. Do I really follow Him daily? Or is it just an image that I follow? So this is an example of an orthodox icon of the transfiguration. This is a very, one of my favorite icons. So you see in it the Lord transfigured, glistening, shining white as snow, brighter than everything and so on. You have... On one side, you have Elijah. You have, on the other side, Moses. And like the, the Synexarium taught us, and like St. Luke says, they appeared speaking to Jesus about his decease. Even in the moment of his amazing glory, they're talking about the crucifixion. Because there is no glory without suffering. Then at the bottom, you have Peter, James, and John. Which one is Peter? Which one is John? Which one is James, you think? Let's start with one, which one's Peter here. Is this Peter? Raise your hand if this is Peter. Wow, I'm impressed. Is this Peter? Whoa, is this Peter? Wow, that's great. You're absolutely right. This is Peter. St. Peter was, according to the tradition, according to what the gospel teaches, says, Lord, he, he looked at the Lord in the moment of all this, and he said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. St. Peter was always known to have that, you know, character of courage and impulsivity at different times in the way he spoke and did things. This doesn't mean Peter, James, uh, James and John were like no good. No, they were great. But you can see that the awesomeness of God's glory, they couldn't handle it. Imagine you're like, you're standing in a sudden a cloud comes down into the church and covers us like that. It wouldn't be a very like, oh, that's nice, that's fun. It would be pretty awesome. It would strike awe in us. 
seeing Jesus this way. Even St. John, who later on writes the Revelation and sees Jesus in his glory, after he is the same John who put his head on Jesus' chest and was the one that even signed his gospel saying, the disciple whom Jesus loved, even St. John, when he saw Jesus in his glory, in Revelation, not just in Transfiguration, he fell to the ground on his face as dead. Say, why? Because the glory of God and the true awesomeness of God cannot be described in words. No matter how much you praise Him and glorify Him on earth, you cannot begin to understand with your human senses the glory of God. It's beyond what our mental capacity can handle, our eyes can handle, and so on. It's not because it's scary in a scary way, like a monster scary. No, it's awesome in its beauty and glory that is beyond what any definition on earth can give. So, this is a depiction of the, of the icon. Now, let's look at some of the passages in the gospel that refer to this. So, St. Saint Mark writes this, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Now, the point of the transfiguration is to reveal the glory of God that will be revealed in eternity and with some witnesses, Peter, James, and John. Now, for us every day awaits us a transfiguration. Every day the Lord is leading us. See the word, He led them, right? He led them. And He wants to lead us too. However, some choose not to be led by Him or say, you know, I'm good where I am. There's a famous quote that says, every man or woman, is as close to God as he or she wants to be. It's not that God, you know, God prefers him, so he's like bringing him here. Uh, you, you can stay there by the parking lot. No, that's not how it is with God. You're only as close to God as you want to be. He did not die on the cross to save just a couple of people in Palestine in the first century. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And those who seek Him diligently will find Him. So He's trying to lead every one of us. Some of us say, thank you, I'm good enough here. This is good enough for me. Oh, oh no, that's enough. Don't, no, not, don't, not close. No, that's too close. Stay where you are, please. I'm good enough like that. And He says, but I want to lead you to more. I want to show you my glory. Do you want to see it or not? Some people are content. But this is a false sense of contentment. Please take this as a very big warning. Beware, this is a false sense of contentment. It's a false sense of satisfaction. When they think, I'm good like this. I go to church on Sunday and I do the thing. And some people do even less than that. They don't even go to church, period. No, but I'm okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. No, I don't need to read my Bible every day. I hear about it on Sunday for a few minutes. That's fine. That's good enough. Beware, this is a false sense of contentment and satis satisfaction. This is not reality. That's not the glory God Christ wants to give us. So he led them up on a high mountain. The high mountain is a place where, I mean, I visited this mountain. Those of us who went to Jerusalem uh, during the trip, we went up to Mount Tabor. The bus ride to go up the mountain, there's like, I can't tell you how many swirls around the mountain the bus has to take all the way up to get to the top of this mountain. It's enormous. It's huge. I don't know how they actually went up the mountain that day. I don't even know how they excavated and paved the road. I don't know how many swirls, like I said, go up to the top. It's very high up. Very high. And the Lord wants to take us that high. Sadly, some people seek to get high on marijuana and other drugs, on pornography, on gambling, on video games, on whatever form of entertainment possible because they're trying to either escape the reality or they're trying to find some high mountain to get to and they're not finding it. And if they found it using these substances, they would use it and that would be it. But they continue to use and reuse and abuse because there's no satisfaction. There is no satisfaction. True satisfaction is and only will be found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, this is fact. This is reality which we will all witness ourselves on the day of judgment. He wants to lead us daily. Most people say, I don't have time daily to go up on the high mountain and spend time with Jesus. I don't have the time. I don't have the time. As we say, and I've been saying for years, make the time. If you don't make the time, if you don't choose to make the time, you will never, ever, ever have the time. 
something will always come in that is quote unquote more pressing to take that time away from the time you need to spend with Jesus. That's why there are some people who make it a point to wake up earlier and they wake up, they can't even see in front of them. Or they sleep later while everyone else is fast asleep in the house and they, they can't even see in front of them from the exhaustion. But they say, I need my time on the mountain with the Lord alone. That's the only way I'll see Him in His glory and that's what keeps feeding me to keep going and that's what also reveals to me things. Because Peter, James and John being scared and afraid and so on reminds us of us. Now, we see, oh wow, that's beautiful, it's awesome, it's great, I love it. But there are also times where Jesus may reveal things to us that we don't want to know about ourselves. And sometimes that's another reason why people kind of stay away because they don't want to see the reality. But Jesus, in His glory, imagine if I'm standing in the dark and I'm wearing this tunic and there's a big spot of spaghetti sauce right here. Am I going to see it in the dark? Am I? Hello? I won't see it in the dark. But if you turn on the light, hey, I didn't notice that. And then if the light gets brighter and brighter, I may notice other spots that I didn't see. And some of them might be smaller and smaller. The brighter the light, the more exposed I am to the light. That's why St. Paul says, whatever makes manifest is light. The light manifests itself and manifests to me the reality. This is good, work on that, keep increasing it. Mm, this one, you have to get rid of it. This is no good. This is preventing you from the glory I want to reveal to you now and in eternity. That's why St. Peter said, be saved from this perverse generation. A perverse generation is a generation that keeps meandering back and forth. Like there's a very famous quote in Arabic that says, an hour for your heart and an hour for your God. Everyone knows that, right? Those of you who speak Arabic, you know exactly what I'm saying. But in the translation in English, an hour for your heart and an hour for your God. That principle, this dualistic principle, will not lead us to the kingdom of God. I promise you that too. It can't. It can't. You can't. It doesn't make sense. When you have people that are struggling daily, that are risking their life to get to church in the first place, like, for them going to church means they may not come out of it alive because someone will come in and bomb the place. When you have people that walk hours just to find their spiritual advisor, walk up mountains and cliffs and get to caves just to spend time with the Lord, and we have others who, to them, this is not necessary. The light will reveal to us beautiful things, joyful things, renew our energy, give us more and more and more but it will also show us things that need to be fixed and changed. And every one of us, every one of us, without exception. And that's why there was that reaction. Now a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear Him. Listen to Him. The divinity spoke at that moment of glory. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. Open your ears, but not these ears. These are fine, you're hearing fine. But open these ears and hear, the ear of your heart and the eye of your heart. Open it. So, well, I have to open it? Isn't it supposed to be opened for me? Well, He gave you everything you need to open it. It's not a mystery. There's no mystery here. So, well, you mean there's plenty of mysteries? Yeah, there are. But the greatest mystery is what? That He loves us beyond our comprehension, that He wants us in heaven. That's all it, that's all it is. So hear Him, but don't just hear Him with this ear. And that's why he says, the Lord says, Why do you call me Lord, 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 Lord? But you don't do the things I say. Why? What's the point? Don't call me Lord then. Lord means someone that lords over your life, is in charge of your life, is the master of your life. That's what a Lord is. So they came down from the mountain finally, as we know. And that's going to happen. We need to spend that time daily with the Lord, alone, to be replenished, refilled, refueled, and also our eyes and hearts may be open to the reality that needs to be either changed or maintained or improved. But then there's a time to come down, right? You can't. You have to go to work. Well, I spent my time with the Lord. Oh, I have to wake up the kids. I have to get them ready for school. I have to get into the car. I have to clean off the snow. I have to... Yes, you have to get down from the mountain. But does not mean when you get, off, get down from the mountain that... You have to leave Jesus back up on the mountain. He comes down with you. He comes down with you. Like He did with them that morning. He comes down with you. 
and goes with you to work and to school and to the home and to the kitchen and to everywhere. Don't leave him up on the mountain. He doesn't say, leave me here and you go. He says, I'm going to come down with you. He'll follow you, follow you wherever you go. But he's saying, follow me wherever you go. Meaning, what does that mean? Follow me, Lord. The Lord tells me, follow me wherever you go. He means, take me with you. Keep me always on your mind and your heart. Isaiah the prophet says, you, 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 Lord, will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Keep your mind stayed on Christ. Pray the Jesus prayer regularly. Little prayers in your heart when you're working, when you're teaching, when you're speaking, when you're eating, when you're drinking, whatever you're doing. And that will help you make the right decisions. Wait a minute, this is not Jesus. This does not honor Jesus. I'm out of here. Doing this does not honor Jesus. Out. Next. Switch. Quick. This is the going down of the mountain part for each one of us. Now, our life could be represented by many ways. Every human, human being on earth has different representations as to how they live their life. Some people are living a conveyor belt Christian life. Everybody knows this belt, the carousel at the airport. You know when you finally come down to the airplane and you look airline flight number Air Canada 761 from I don't know where, carousel number 7 for your bags. Everybody rushes down after customs to get to that carousel. Some people are like these bags on this carousel. It looks like it's fun, it's busy, there are people, it's nice, you get to see around, you go around, you get a 360 degree view of everything, it's beautiful, it's great, but does it get you anywhere? It gets you nowhere. These bags sit there and you know, you think about it, after everybody's taken their bags and gone, there's always like three, four bags that are left there because they were switched or lost or somebody forgot or they took the wrong bag. And then these, these bags that are just going around and around, going nowhere forever. And there are a lot of Christians living this way, sadly. There are many Christians that are like these suitcases, going around and around, daily routine, work, school, friends, parties, whatevers, back and forth, but going nowhere with their life. Absolutely nowhere. No high mountain. They don't want the high mountain. They are just preoccupied and kept busy with this. Just like the mosquito that heads to that you know, halogen light and bzz, gets zapped when it's time to die. Just completely dazzled by false entertainment and spending their week or even their weekend, whatever, doing things that will lead them nowhere constantly. But it feels like everything is steady. This is not what you want to be. But I'm telling you the truth, many of us are like this. This is a warning for us to watch out, to wake up, and to wake up our friends and loved ones, if we care about them truly, that are sleeping right now, or didn't come this morning for whatever reasons from last night or late last night, or those who are, for various reasons, lost. Get them off the conveyor belt. Don't leave them there. We have to do something. Me first, of course, but we all together, because I can't do it alone. Every one of us has to get these bags off this conveyor belt. We're not met. Jesus did not die on the cross or wasn't transfigured or rose from the dead for us to go round and round on a merry-go-round. That's not why he went and suffered for us. Some people like this view instead. This is great. What's wrong with this? You get up, you put your feet on the escalator, and the escalator will glide you up all the way to the next floor. This is not Christianity either. People think, you know, hey, as long as I get on the step, I got baptized, I baptized the boy or the girl, I go to church once in a while, I, do the Christ I put some money once in a while, I do it, I'm going to go up, I'm getting to heaven. Mm, sorry. Heaven doesn't work like that. Heaven does not work like that either. This is not denying my cross and taking up my cross daily and following Him. Jesus went up all the way up the mountain. He took them to the mountain of Tabor to be transfigured, but He went up the mountain of Golgotha alone to die for each one of us. So an escalator life Christian also is not real. So the Lord said, the, the disciples said, we must through many tribulations inherit the kingdom. Escalators are not going to get us to heaven. There's no escalator to heaven. I haven't seen one. Have you seen an escalator leading up to the skies? doesn't exist. doesn't work like that either. This is a reality of our Christian struggle. The ladder. Not stairs even. A ladder. Imagine taking a ladder all the way up to heaven. That would be scary, right? Because some people taking up a ladder just up to here might be afraid of a fall down onto this carpet. So a ladder is not an easy climb. At all. 
But this is reality. It's not a conveyor belt that most people are on. It's not an escalator that people love because it's nice and comfortable. There's no exertion that needs to be done. But this is the reality. There's a very famous book I, I highly recommend you read called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. Even the title of it is up here on the icon. The Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. Now, this icon depicts the book. Here, St. John is saying, and this is his, ascend, my brothers, ascend eagerly. Ascend, my brethren, ascend eagerly. So go. You have to go on the ladder. You have no choice. You want to get to heaven? Get on the ladder. Get off the conveyor belt. Get off the escalator and get to work. That's what he's saying. Ascend, my brethren, ascend eagerly. Be eager. Be eager to inherit your crown. That's what he's saying here. Then you have people climbing up and our Lord Jesus awaiting them. And as soon as they're ready, he grabs them and brings them up in to the kingdom. But you have along the way different traps. You have devils yanking people off the ladder, convincing them to take a break. Just take a break. It's okay. It's fine. Don't push yourself too hard. Come on. You deserve to rest a bit. You don't have to fast 40 days and 40 nights like Jesus did. Take a break. And the devil convinces us to take it easy and relax. But relaxing is not here. True relaxation, true rest, true peace is not on earth either. It doesn't mean that there's no joy on earth. There's no peace and mercy. Because that's why St. Paul said, Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied to you. There's a lot of grace, mercy, and peace awaiting us here. A lot of it. And that's why St. Paul was able to write, even though he was shipwrecked and almost stoned to death and almost killed many times and all kinds of tribulations and difficulties he went through, he said, we are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing because I have the joy that is set before me. I have heaven waiting for me. What entertainment on earth could compare to heaven? Think about it. Think about it. Nothing. Nothing on earth can compare to the joy of heaven. And yet, the devil convinces us of such. And people fall off, yanked off the ladder. So hold on to the ladder tight. There's a very famous saint in our church called Saint Sarah the Nun. And she says, when I go up the ladder, when I put my foot on this first rung of the ladder, before going up to the next step, I don't say, okay, I say, I be careful, I watch out because I don't want the devil to convince me that I'm okay, that I'm doing fine, that I'm going to get to that next step in a second. I take my steps very carefully because my spiritual life and my eternal life is not a joke. In other words, we need to take our life with Christ seriously. It's not a joke. Yes, it's full of love, joy, mercy, forgiveness, all the virtues that Christ wants to give each and every one of us. But it's not a joke. It's not to be taken lightly. But too many people do take it lightly. This is the 30 steps of the book. I'm not going to read all of them. There's no time and there's too small for you. But I'm just going to show you some of them. First one is on renunciation of the world. You can't read it from far probably. On detachment. On uh, remembrance of death. Being ready to go. On freedom from anger. On slander or gossip. One of the steps of the ladder is beware of gossip. On lying. On the stomach. Gluttony. Um, on discernment of thoughts. On the love of money and selfishness. Just some of the examples that you find in this book. And it's interesting to see what St. John has to tell us. This icon represents what? This is one of the parables of our Lord Jesus. Which one would it be? Excellent. The, the ten virgins. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Do they look any different? Can you tell the difference between the wise and the foolish? Clothing, wise, height, facial skin color, anything? Does it look any different? These are the foolish ones outside. These are the wise ones inside. Do they look really any different at first glance? There's no difference. No difference. It says they're all virgins. It says those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil and their vessels with their lamps. 
But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. If they all slumbered and slept, means the wise also slept. Everyone slept. Meaning everyone goes through their... But there's a difference. You can't see it on the outside. We can't tell who's the wise virgin and who's the foolish virgin. Everyone is virgin. Meaning everyone is called to sainthood in Christ. Called to be saints, everyone. But there are some who are living without maintaining their vessels. Without putting oil in their lamps. What's the oil? The constant climbing of the ladder daily. Therefore, St. Paul says, My beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Don't just listen when, oh, he's telling me I have to listen to him. Even when he or she, even when Abuna is not with you in the house when you're all alone. You don't need Abuna to be constantly eating off your ear, reminding you to read and pray. Abuna is not the one that's going to get you to heaven. But now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He says, work out your own salvation. Take ownership of your salvation. Personify your salvation. That's why the Holy Father said, the Lord, the God of my salvation. Take ownership of it. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Take it seriously. Yes, no matter what we do, we're not getting to heaven without the mercy of God. But do your best to honor the sacrifice of Christ. We can't get to heaven without Him. But we can honor Him with everything we've got when we enter, starting from now. That's why St. Paul writes also, we, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus, like He kept His eyes on the cross, even in transfiguration. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You have a race before you. It's not a race on a conveyor belt, and it's not a race on an escalator. It's a ladder you have to climb. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. We have not died for Christ physically. Nobody came and said, Are you Christian? I will kill you if you're Christian. I'm going to behead you if you're Christian. I'm going to arrest you if you're Christian. I'm going to whip you if you're Christian. None of us went through that. But we are striving in sin. This is what we can do right now. If we're not called to bloodshed, we can be called to true Christian witness or true spiritual martyrdom every day of our life. The integrity that is required of a Christian when no one is looking. The integrity that is required of a Christian when he or she is alone. Not when, okay, I don't want to do this with them, but I'll do this with him or with her, whatever. It doesn't work like that. True integrity with Christ is when no one's looking. It doesn't matter who's looking, because Christ is always looking and watching and witnessing everything. St. John writes, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We have this hope in us, the hope that we can all inherit the kingdom of God. We have that hope in us. And we trust in it. So we work on purifying ourselves regularly because He is pure. Just as He is pure. Jesus, you're pure. I want to be pure too. I want to be pure too. And I ask Him daily and He purifies me. Jeremiah writes, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Search for Jesus with all your heart. That's why the first commandment was, was love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, with all your strength and your neighbor as yourself. Give Him all you've got and you will have no regrets in the end. You will have zero regrets in the end. And that's why it is said, aim for heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. Aim for earth, you'll get neither. If your aim is for this life only, you get nothing in heaven. Nothing. What a sad ending. To live my eternal life with no reward? Why? 
Aim for earth. Seek first the kingdom of God. Aim for heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Oh, who transfigured on man.